Well, I noticed that there were a lot of you up there, and I hope you are back up there. Just go ahead and plug in again. I got ready to uh, uh, down the music and bring up the video and hit finish instead. And uh, so I did one of my normal, typical, brain-dead kind of things. So I pray that you are back with me this morning. I did see uh, Debbie was up there, and I want to give a shout out and say hi to her. Uh, Alyssa, yeah. <laughs> That's either uh, laugh out loud, love you, Pastor, thank you. I, I, I did one of my normal, usual kind of uh, uh, things instead of bringing uh, the the music out and the video up, uh, I hit finish and uh, <clears throat> and we finished. So uh, Alyssa was uh, you were there. Thank you. God bless. It's good to see you back with us this morning. Uh, let's see. There's Debbie. I saw Debbie was up there. Good morning again. Thank you very much. It's just my way of uh, starting the day, I guess. Uh, it's just kind of a crazy thing. Every once in a while, I'll do it. Uh, I'll hit the wrong button, and when I hit the wrong button, I get myself in all kinds of trouble. And, you know, the yeah, here I am again. Thank you, Terry. Glad to see that. Helen, I'm glad you're back there. <coughs> you guys are all so patient with me. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I, I need to be loved, folks. I got to tell you, it's... Uh, uh, I don't know what it is. It's just, I guess it's just the way uh, I'm just fumble fingers sometimes, I guess. And the funny thing is, if I accidentally hit finish, there's a there's a prompt that says, do you really want to do that? Cancel. And I thought I'd moved over to cancel so that I wouldn't do that, and I hit finish a second time. So <clears throat> at any rate, here we are. Uh, Terry, uh, we all do it sometimes. I, I, I appreciate that. I guess when you, when you do as many of these as we do, that there's going to be once or twice that there's going to be a foul up of some sort, but good morning, everybody. You guys are so precious. And I thank you all so very much for your love and your patience toward me. Uh, it is good. I hope, I hope, uh, uh, little Cody's feeling better, uh, getting over his cold. And I want to give a shout out to Karen and Cam. And, uh, uh, I give a shout out to, to all those folks that, uh, well, you're just, you're just special. And, uh, uh, Debbie has, uh, Avery and she's got Mia and, uh, uh, you know, the crew there and, I don't know whether they're on or not, but uh, we love them and we pray for them. It's it is so good uh, to have you all. You know, you're precious. You really are. Let's jump in and 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 do our our, our kind of a recap and then move into the rest of the study this morning. Uh, you know, we started out yesterday looking at this unpopular teaching, and we're still there because Jesus is going to be talking about the cross. Uh, you know, he's already relayed to them that he is going to suffer. Uh, this unpopular teaching has to do with the cross and the necess necessity of Christ's death and resurrection in verses 31 and 32. It says, He began to teach them that the Son of God must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. And he was stating this matter plainly. Uh, in other words, that, that the tense of that verse verb plainly uh, gives us the understanding that he just continued. He drove the point home. Uh, he didn't want them to miss. He he talked about his death. He talked about his passion before, uh, but it always been veiled. This time he comes right out and lays it before them. And he doesn't want them to be mistaken over what he's saying. Over and over and over, he taught them what would happen. His brief comment, you know, clearly indicates that Mark allows for no possibility that Jesus could be misunderstood. Uh, what Jesus uh, said. Uh, was no parable, wasn't cloaked in, in, in uh, uh, subtle language uh, that needed to be understood in some spiritual term uh, for the truth to be made known. No, it records that Jesus spoke of his own suffering plainly. And it seems obvious also that the disciples thoroughly understood what he was saying 
because of Peter's response. At the end of that, it says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Good morning, Miss Jessica. It's good to see you and to see Miss Sadie as well. So give Miss Sadie a kiss. Uh, need to give you a call today so we can talk about baby dedication. Oh, by the way, speaking of baby dedication, uh, some years ago, we had that opportunity with two fine little girls. They're nice, wonderful women now, and uh, with families of their own and grandchildren of their own. And that would be my two daughters, Laura and uh, Tanya. And today, on the 20th of June, 1974, they entered the world. So this is their birthday today. So I give them a shout out and a happy birthday. They were down, we had Laura and, and Chris were down this weekend. So we had them all there together. Uh, we were able to uh, be loved by them and love on them. Uh, Laura and Chris went back yesterday, spent some time with them in the morning. But uh, so this is their birthday. So happy birthday to my sweet wonderful girls. And my wife says, good morning again. I love you too, my dear. Thank you. All right. But Peter took him aside and rebuked him. Now the word rebuke here is a, about the strongest word you can use in the Greek. It is stern, sharp, uh, like a parent, you know, sharply rebuking a child for a major offense. Uh, just short of grabbing a hold of them and just shaking them. You, you ever want to do that? Uh, in that rebuke of Peter, according to Matthew, we find the basic philosophy of the world edging itself out in Peter's words. Kind of this, spare yourself. You know, number one, look out for number one. Nothing's more important than, than you. Uh, Matthew says that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it. This shall never happen to you. Yeah. We all feel the pressure of that kind of philosophy upon our life. We, we do. You think of yourself first. Take care of number one. Provide for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Self becomes the most important character in our life. Uh, there's nothing new. Truthfully, it's been around since the very first temptation when Satan tempted Eve to mistrust God and put her desires ahead of God's purpose and plan. In Genesis 3, verses 4 through 7, we, we see this conversation. It's one that we know, we've heard, right? And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open." And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from the fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, certainly were, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. You see what happened is they pursued their own desires. They saw what was good. Why would God want to withhold from me something that I find desirable? And the moment they ate of that fruit, the glory of God was no longer upon their life. And they saw themselves for first time without you know, God's covering of his glory. And they knew they were naked. They were shamed. And good morning, Miss Carolyn. You missed the fun. I blanked myself out and had to come back in again. Did one of my little, little jobs. So good to have you here this morning. This attitude truly is removed a long way from the attitude of Christ. Who didn't think it robbery to be equal with God? He didn't think of himself. He thought of you and he thought of me. He put us and our interests even ahead of his own divine nature. Now, that's a tough one to get our head around and understand. 
as I said yesterday, we always need to be on guard that our desires, our agendas, don't supersede God's purposes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you take our our mistakes and our errors, and Lord, you make them all right. You build off of that. I thank you for the encouragement and love that I get day by day from this family of people that join together to come around your word and learn of you. God, I thank you that they're patient with me and overlook my little mistakes. But the main thing is, the, the, the core of the heart of this is that we come together around your word to hear a word from you. That's more important, more necessary in our life than anything. Nothing matters like hearing from you. So I ask you to open your word to us and our understanding to it. God, let them too be melted together. And let us take in the word, Lord, like like food, like, like the very nourishment for our souls, which it is. Take it in and, and make it a part of us. We thank you for that, Lord. Now, Lord, I just thank you for my two girls, for their birthday today. Thank you for what what they have been to Sherry and I over all these years. How precious, how wonderful. Thank you for that gift, Lord. The gift of my three children, Lord, have been such a blessing. Thank you. Now, Lord, as we come together, let us worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Why did Peter reject this truth of the Messiah's suffering and death and then go so far as to brazenly, really, rebuke the one he just has recognized as the Messiah, as the son of the living God? Well, it's simple. He didn't like what Jesus had to say. You know, that could be any of us, couldn't it? You know, at, at one moment we are so pleased and uh, and blessed by God and we're praising him in one moment and then, then he says something that kind of, you know, hits a sour note within us, maybe brushes up against something that we don't want to deal with. And there we are, off to the races again. He didn't like what Jesus had to say. It didn't line up with what he wanted. It didn't conform to his already perceived worldview or his human viewpoint. He, he already had in mind the Messiah that he grew up understanding would be. From the time he entered Torah school uh, on up, he'd been taught this is what the Messiah would do. This is what the Messiah will look like. This is what the Messiah is coming for. In Isaiah 55, in verses 8 and 9, uh, we need to heed these words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, it's that's, that's kind of tough for us to keep in mind sometimes. Would you agree with that? Because we often think that we have the, you know, the best advice you know, to give God. We can help him out with this. But then we ask God, why? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why this? Why that? Well, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are higher than our ways. Here with Peter, and with the words of Isaiah, we need to realize that we will not always understand what God is doing. But that's not an issue. An issue is whether we're going to put our faith, our trust in him for what he's doing. 
even if we don't completely understand it. Listen, we're watching God do some things uh, that, that, no, we don't completely understand, but we don't want to miss it either. We want to grab a hold and we want to go along for the ride and let God be God and let God do what God does. But you see, when it's the blessings that we're seeing now, that's easy to do or easier, I think, than what it goes against what we desire or what we want. Job didn't understand, did he? But he trusted. Peter didn't like the fact that Jesus said he was going to die. And so often we don't uh, like what the Lord is saying to us through his word or through our life circumstances. But we need to surrender to him knowing that God knows best. Now, Jesus doesn't take the rebuke kindly. He's pretty firm here. But turning around and seeing the disciples. Now see, I think this is an element we miss sometimes. Jesus turns around. And I think he sees the effect of what Peter's saying and doing upon the rest of the group. Turning around, seeing his disciples, he rebukes Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Now there's a rebuke. Now only Peter, well Mark, you know, through Peter's discussion, records when Jesus turned to address Peter directly, he noticed the disciples. This is the, you'll only find this in Mark's gospel. I think I, I think Peter. Uh, th this had to deeply impact Peter's life. In Peter's words: Jesus turns around to check on the other disciples. Probably sees, you know, that they've heard, and once he saw that they were aware of what Peter was doing, he clearly felt that he had to put things right and very firmly. They all looked to Peter. And he had uh, to be uh, he had to be made clear to them, every one of them, that all of them that were present, that the ideas were not only not reliable, but in fact came from a very dangerous source. We should always consider people's feelings, especially when we're correcting somebody. I always tell people, if you got to correct somebody, don't do it in a public setting. You know, get them alone, get, get you know, maybe, you know, uh, some support people and stuff, but, but don't embarrass them publicly. But there are times when a person's feelings have to come second to the truth, especially when open error is involved and other people are brought into that. Understand, uh, I think Jesus probably would have rebuked Peter privately, if this had been a private conversation between he and Peter. But it wasn't. I mean, the others had overheard. And I think this is why Mark, and, and again, Mark is, is is writing Peter's testimony out here. I think it's because, you know, when, Peter, when, when Jesus turned around, saw the other disciples, and it's, it, it's remarked in Mark here, he saw the impact that it had on them. And the impact that it had on them was very negative. So he had to set the record straight. He rebuked Peter. Whereas Peter's rebuke was, in the present tense, infinity. The Lord's rebuke of Peter was in the aorist tense, indicative. This change in the form shows that the Lord gave a very specific and definite rebuke. That's where we get this, get behind me, Satan. This rebuke should come to us as it came to them as a, as a shock, a, a slap in the face. The impact must have been used. I, I, I think if Jesus would have slapped him or thrown a bucket of cold water in his face, it would have been more startling. I mean, he must have shaken Peter to the core. And the other disciples, probably as much, to be openly called Satan, 
Now there are those who who uh, uh, would say, well, he's just he, he's he's talking about you know the uh, the influence that that Satan was having. No, he's it, it, this is a direct quote. He's calling Peter, get behind me, Satan. It was intended by Jesus to have just that kind of effect. Peter's words were dangerous to the extreme. They went against the whole purpose of God and had to be shown for what they were. To go against the word of God was to behave as Satan. It was direct rebellion against God. What Peter was doing wasn't just uh, uh, a nicety trying to uh, to encourage, no, no, we don't want this ever to happen to you. You know, this, this. No, Peter has come right out and said, this will not happen to you. And God said, yes, it will. My will is that my son come into the world to die. So what Peter's doing is a direct rebellion against God's plan. What Jesus was saying in the most uncompromising fashion was that Peter had become Satan's instrument through a combination of self-conceit and worldly wisdom and that as such, he could have no part in Christ. He must get behind him. Only once that he had come to his senses could he once again be accepted face to face. You know, the same kind of uh, exchange on a milder level came about the night before Jesus was crucified. When Peter says, if everybody abandoned you, I won't. Not me, not Peter, uh-uh. And Jesus said, Satan has desired to sift you, Peter. But once you're restored, you'll restore the brethren. Can you imagine Peter is declaring that nothing will drive me away from you. Everybody else leave you. I'll be here for you. And Jesus looks at him and says, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, do you understand? Satan has asked to sift you. He's gotten permission to sift you. But once you're restored, and you will be, you'll restore the brethren. Again, I think that was like a, you know, a, a cold bucket of water in his face. If we equate this passage with that which occurred in the wilderness back in Matthew 4, we can see that the same temptation which Satan directly offered to Jesus there uh, that he could obtain the authority of all these kingdoms of the world without going down the path that led to the cross is the one that Peter suggests as a friend. Satan hung it out. There's a temptation. Show you all the kings of the world. They're yours. Just bow down. Worship me. Jesus didn't deny that he had the power to, to turn those kingdoms over to somebody. But he said, uh, you don't tempt the Lord your God. Now, a friend comes to him and says, you know, no, you don't go to the cross. Can't allow that. See, the temptation is so similar then as to be one and the same, even if it's in different words and with different motives. By valuing the things that this world values, like the lack of suffering, Peter shows himself to be in league with the last one he wanted to be in league with. He was in league with the devil. The religious leaders later echo Satan's same temptation while Jesus is hanging on the cross. In Matthew 27, verses 42-43, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross. Oh, if you'll come down off the cross, we'll believe in you. Trust in God. Let him deliver him now. He takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. But you see the taunt? Come down from the cross. Come down from the cross. We must not soften the situation by suggesting that Jesus is actually addressing Satan. 
He's addressing the one who had allowed himself to the folly and pride and carelessness to become a messenger of the adversary. The words that follow are not directed at Satan, but they're directed at Peter. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. There is the problem. Peter, where's your mind at? Where do you have your mind set? Certainly are not set on, on, on God's interests, but on man's. The Greek word translated mind there is uh, phronel. It means to think, to form or hold an opinion, to make a judgment. It can mean to have the same thoughts as, and I think that's the, the way it's being used. It's the same word that is used in, in Philippians 2, in verse 5, when it says it has attitude, this phronel, this mind, this phoneo, this, uh, the, the, the same thoughts. Good morning, Miss Sue. I heard you pop in too. In yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. In other words, think the same thoughts he does. Have the same attitudes he has. At this point in time, Mark, or Mark is telling us that Peter is demonstrating the same thoughts that Satan has. That's the power behind this. For now, could involve taking someone's side, espousing someone's cause, and that's exactly thinking the same thoughts. That's that's what's meant here. Peter is unconsciously siding with men confused by Satan and not with God. One moment he almost seems to know the truth with great clarity, and the next he's just blind to the truth. His spiritual sight is limited and it's partial. In other words, what's at stake, what is most important, is not what we think that Christ ought to do or how we think Christianity should be established, but what God says, what God thinks. What matters is God's will, not Mike's, not Peter's. The only place that we find life, forgiveness, peace, and right standing with God is in trusting the crucified and risen Christ. And the only place that God is glorified is in his will being accomplished. For that reason, the, raw, the cross rebounds to the glory of God. Man saw it as a as a detestable thing. God saw it as a platform of glory. Peter being called Satan by Jesus was was so startling that it must have burned itself into the minds of the disciples, and that was Jesus's intention. It made them recognize that they were totally wrong about their expectations, and in the future. They were always really weary about what they said to Jesus and about Jesus. We all need to work. That's, that's, that's part of my job on a daily basis for me, is to work to replace my own human viewpoint with a divine viewpoint. Make sure that my mind is constantly adjusted to the word of God and not to the word of Mike that my attitudes be adjusted to the attitudes of Christ and not the attitudes of the world. You understand what I'm saying? There's a constant activity of adjustment and readjustment in our life that is required. One of the questions I always ask on the listening guide is what adjustments do I need to make in my life to accommodate the word of the will of God? You see, that's that's what I have to do. I, I have to look at the Word. I have to evaluate my life based upon what the Word of God says, and I have to make those <coughs> adjustments, big ones or subtle ones. It doesn't make a difference. It may be just a little tweak that I have to make in an attitude to accommodate the will and the Word, the way of God. In that, God is glorified. And like I said Sunday, it's not 
necessarily the big grandiose things we do. Sometimes it's the little bitty things that we adjust in our life that brings maximum glory to God. And that's what we need to be looking for. Because usually it's the little things that's going to trip us up, isn't it? Solomon talks about uh, little foxes that destroy the vineyard. You always had to be aware of them. Little bit, they'd crawl in, they'd get under the fence, and they would rip up the plants. It's the little things that usually trip us up, isn't it? It's that little attitude. It's that little thing that, uh, uh, that we don't think too often about, or we think, well, it's not a big deal, that ends up usually kicking us in the shin. This adjustment can only come about as we choose to learn the word, as we choose to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus' mission involves the cross, those who follow him must embrace the same price. Now, on some level, some will bear the cross in a more obvious way, through martyrdom or whatever, others, but we are all called to bear our cross. We don't hear much today in American churchianity about suffering. We wear crosses, and I, I know I, I've got one, you know, like jewelry, mainly because the, the Christian symbol has lost a lot of its original significance. I, I, I think few of us would enjoy sporting around a miniature uh, electric chair or uh, 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 lethal injection table or a, a gallows around our neck. You see, there was no greater way in which people of the first century could express their utter disgust with a human being than by crucifying them. It was the chief and most extreme form of human degradation that ever existed. It was, in the fullest sense of the word, an absolute obscenity. To be beaten and stripped totally naked and nailed or tied to a cross to die over a period sometimes of days from exposure and, and, and vermin and disease and dehydration and, and all of these things. Absolute obscenity. The, in polite Roman society, the word cross was an obscene word and not to be uttered in polite society. Cicero, he wrote, he said, let the very name of the cross, I don't know whether I put that up there. No. At the very name of the cross, be far removed not only from the body of a Roman citizen, but even from his thoughts, eyes, and ears. And by Jewish law, anyone who was crucified died under the curse of God. Cursed is any man who hangs upon a tree. Some Western Christians expect unlimited prosperity. Or they teach that Christians will escape all tribulation. While at the same time, we have brothers and sisters other, in other places in the world, in Iran, Pakistan, Sudan, who die for their faith. Others that, that, that we are in contact with that are, are ministering in, in very dangerous situations within their own life hard. We overlook that. It is possible that some health, wealth Christians today are still speaking the devil's message. Oh, God doesn't want you to suffer. Oh, then why do so many suffer if it's not within the purpose and the plan of God? At the cross of Christ, God triumphed. The triumph over sin, death, hell, Satan, and the triumph of God's law, justice, and righteousness, and holiness center in the death and the resurrection of his son. Is it any wonder 
that Paul said that he he wanted to glory only in the cross of Christ, to which the world was crucified to him and he to the world. Glory in the cross. John's revelation pulls back the curtain for just a glimpse of this as the angelic hosts and the redeemed of all ages glory and triumph of God through Christ. In Revelation 5, verses 12 and 13, and saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and in and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and forever. God's eternal purpose centers in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus do it? Why did he die? To be, we know, our substitute. But God demonstrated his love toward his, toward, uh, 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 to, uh, demonstrated his own uh, love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Jesus did all the work. And all we need to do is trust in what he did. Martin Luther said, Nothing more is required of justification than to hear of Jesus and believe on him as our Savior. Oh, salvation's free. But it, it's not cheap. The New Testament is full of instructions about discipleship. And here in Mark's gospel, we're going to move in and find Jesus beginning to teach the 12 just what discipleship is all about. They knew he had called them. They saw themselves as his followers, but did they understand what it meant to follow him? The call of Jesus to follow me is a call to discipleship. <laughs> there we go. And that's where we're going to go tomorrow. We're going to unfold this whole concept of discipleship. Now, there's some out there, uh, there's uh, groups out there that say, well, you you can't be a believer and become until you're a disciple. You have to be a learn. You have to you know grow to a certain stage before you're you're capable and able to be saved. That's again a works based theology that I can get myself cleaned up, I can come to a point where I am worthy now of being saved. And my friends, that will never happen. We can never make ourselves worthy. It is he who makes us worthy. Follow me, he says. Now what exactly is entailed in that? We'll look at that tomorrow. Father, I want to thank you so much for the moments that you give us. Moments that we can spend together. Moments that we can open your word. And, and, and if we don't get but a few verses into it, allow you to, to open that up like a flower to our heart and lives. Father, I pray that we have gotten nuggets out of this today that we can, can take and look and see how it applies to our life. Put all those little pieces together with understanding, Lord, making those particular applications and then making the decision to go out and find ways of practicing and doing what the Word of God says. You are so great and so good to us. We thank you. Now, Father, I pray that you give us understanding as we go through this day of what you're doing and how you're working around us, that we might join in on that, Lord, and, uh, and participate in what you are doing. Father, I pray that you open up your word to the heart and lives of many and give us an open and, and, and unashamed witness to them. Father, we love you and we praise you and I pray your blessing upon each one that have come and, 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 and plugged in today. Thank you, Lord, for their participation. Thank you, Lord, for their, their, their devotion to you. 
The Lord bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Listen, last word, love somebody. Reach out and, and do good morning, Miss, Miss Rosa. Good morning to you. Reach out and let somebody know that they're special. Everybody needs to be encouraged. And for some reason, I just feel that it, it's really important today that you find somebody that needs a word of encouragement and you be that word. Oh, what love can be shed that way. Love comes from God. It's of God. Therefore, love one another. That would be John's encouragement to you and me. So God bless you. I'll see you in the morning at 9, and we're going to pick up right here, follow me, and uh, the cost, if you will, of following Christ.